You're listening to On the Path with Dr. Charlie Kyle, Zach Rudis, John Grosowskis. This is episode five, and we're picking up where we left off on episode four, discussing the constitutional right to groove. <laughs> what does okay. that mean? That, that sounds like a great, great request to make of the incoming administration. And, that sounds um, like something George Clinton would say. Yeah. <laughs> Well, any any person in their right mind, with a degree of sanity, serenity, would be asking for grooves all the time, and especially for children. That's what I think has gotten us together to do these podcasts, is the notion that kids really need this empowerment, that particular kind of empowerment that only grooving skills can give you because it connects you to other people in a myriad ways, and it really connects you to yourself. You know, alienation begins at home. You get alienated from your own body, from your, from your own labors, from your society, from the world, um, by the way things are constituted these days. And rather than focus on the negation of the negation, uh, putting off all those things that are in the way of good grooving, just go for it. I think that's what we have to figure out. And I'm trying to figure it out now for some 30 odd years and still haven't figured out certainly how to get media to work with parents and children. Um, it's inherently alienating to not be real live in person. And here we are podcasting against podcasting in a way, you know, uh, podcasting with a, I think of it as a kind of casting out of the fly, of a fly fisherman. You know, you're casting out some different things at the end of the line that you hope will hook some parents and kids on um, changing their whole lifestyle to be part of, participating in. Will to party. Have you got some? Do you want to be having fun more of the time? That's the question, and I hope we're going to come up with really persuasive podcasts, books, gifts. I had it in my head the other day that we should have little gifts like pow, 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 bomb, bomb. Mm -hmm. like, you know, gift the clave and gift the clave. We're trying to give this away, but maybe we have to charge money for it too to uh, keep, keep a cellar open to keep uh, some kind of a center going in every locality where parents and kids can come together and learn how to groove, learn how to make music by ear, by having fun, making it part of games, lots of strategies to make it happen. And one of them is asking the powers that be to uh, have us a gift of, of giving grooves to kids I think that's going to be part of a Biden administration's high priorities. Goes right along with climate change and species extinctions, how to stop them. All all the big goals, global goals, are um, also the smallest goals. It begins with one pebble on the beach, one person getting the idea that, hmm, I've got to be grooving myself if I'm going to help kids to do this. Every parent has to come to that awareness and we'll, we'll help them do that. That's what I, I think our, our goal is and why picking up from last time, which where we, where we were talking about slavery and the alternatives to it and, and how is it still alive? How is slavery still a possibility in 2020 for so many people that they wind up in Saudi Arabia lifted out of Africa and or being indentured servants that's what's going on in some of these other uh, arab emirates and around the middle east uh, people come from the philippines people come from a distraught lebanon they come from you know pe people are refugees in so many different ways um, involuntary immigrants look what's happening with the uh preparations the constructions for the 2022 world cup yeah which i believe is in qatar they have all these basically immigrant 
extremely low wage immigrant workers who are trapped in the country. They can't leave unless their employer uh, authorizes an exit visa. Right. And their the estimation is something like 4,000 people will die during the construction of the World Cup stadiums. How right. grotesque is that? Why is that? Why because they they're die? working in unsafe they're working in unsafe conditions. Wow. And there's terrific and heat. Oh, the Qataris are allowing them to be exploited in FIFA, which is yet another, you know, globalist organization with no real humanitarian accountability. It's not addressing it. Yep. Accountability is the is the watchword. And we need many synonyms for that. I'm not even one doesn't pop into my head right this minute, but it's the unaccountability, the evil anarchy. Uh, you know, no no leadership for taxation of uh, of all the money that's in these offshore havens, tax evasion, tax havens. There's over thirty trillion dollars out there in the Cayman Islands, in Macau, in Hong Kong, and in the Netherlands and Luxembourg. I mean, there are organizations that should be holding all these nations that are part of NATO accountable. I don't know why they're not being held accountable. But uh, it reminds me, I wanted to bring to this fifth podcast, my first podcast really was with Ralph Nader. And it was on August 13th day after my birthday in 2016 I was there plugging our peace book we need a department of peace and I got a half an hour of time there to talk about it and I didn't have my book in front of me on the telephone so Ralph Nader wound up reading passages from the book asking questions and he was wonderful of course he's just you know he picks out exactly the weak points in the argument and emphasizes the strong points and it's a great half hour i'm so happy that i did that i just listened to it yesterday again and it's called waging peace and then slash the second half hour is tax havens with a guy who is so on it he's been thinking about it for a long time i don't have his name in front of me here but you can look up uh, ralph nader radio hour August 13th, 2016, Waging Peace slash Tax Havens. And the reason that pairing is so good is that it, it gets you right to that um, conjoining of something as, as different as Born to Groove and trying to get parents and kids making music together. And then the whole spectrum is right out there to those all these trillions of dollars unaccounted for, untabulated, barely traceable, and all these ways there are for people with fabulous amounts of money to shelter it, to haven it, to hoard it, to pile it up as what uh, Ruskin used to call ilth, which is wealth that's not being worked. A big chunk of that, those trillions of dollars offshore that could be empowering Global literacy for women so they don't have to get pregnant, can read the bottles. Global uh, landmine, landmine retrieval, getting the landmines picked up that have been put over all over the world, different mm -hmm. places. These are simple things that could have been done years ago if anybody had the will to do it or if anybody were holding the militarists accountable. Nobody does. You know, these the, the military and imperialism... Old-fashioned imperialism is going on like it nonstop. And I hope the Biden administration and some of the people in it, maybe John Kerry, who's been put in charge of the climate change thing. But here's how, how sick that is. He's called a czar, a czar of climate change, a czar with no power. You know what I mean? So it's all about um, trying to get some global governance going among the smaller democracies and women's forums all around the world. Women have come, are coming up with the better ideas uh, always how to nurture children.
right? They, they've got to teach us guys how to do that. You go, get from just mothering and nursing and so on to a wider world in which men are fully responsible with their uh, wives or consorts or whoever they've partnered up with. They should be there with that um, born to groove uh, Charlie, on their minds. Charlie, how do you feel about uh, the Biden administration having someone like John Kerry uh, at the head of a climate change response, someone who's not really notable. He's not really notably a, uh, an environmentalist or a conservationist, but he is a extremely well connected diplomat. So right. how do you how do you how do you look at that? I celebrate it, and I just wish they had a Department of Peace or a Czar of Peace. A peace czar. Isn't that bizarre? <laughs> if you'll pardon the pun. I mean, it's bizarre that we call these people doing something good like the Global Organization of Democracies or um, a climate change ambassador. But they, they always want to put this in, in some kind of um, exceptional thing that we're doing rather than let's, this has got to be how we operate from now on with a Department of Peace over here and a Department of uh, Climate Change, Global Warming, Extinction rates that are out of sight now we we've got to get these things renamed redefined departmentalized just enough that people know where they can go with their whistleblowing or with a complaint or with did you know that whales are going extinct faster than we're discovering new species down there in the south south pacific down near antarctica they're, they're finding new varieties, new species of whales, new populations of other species. We're, we're still discovering all the diversity of life on this planet, and yet there's nobody accountable for, for preserving species on a planetary scale, on a global scale. It's very parallel to there's nobody accountable for all that offshore money. And I love the fact that the, the half hour I got to be on the Nader podcast talking about peace was this was shared with a half an hour on this ton of money that's out there and could be utilized for you know everybody on the planet could have a salary of 500 bucks a month with that money and some of it is uninvested it's just sitting there when i asked uh, a banker person in, in switzerland once how much of that offshore money do you think is uninvested and, of course, they would know because they want to have it invested through their banks. And they huddled over there in a corner. There was a quiet moment while they were trying to figure out an answer to this customer's question. And they came back and they said, we think about a third, a quarter to a third of the money offshore is just sitting there, not invested in anything and not invested for sure in children or landmine cleanup or a global literacy campaign so that women can read the instructions on the prophylactics. You know what I mean? The basic things that are so so important to bringing population under control, getting everybody healthy, stopping genocides and global ethnic cleansings. I mean, these are basic things that need to get done if we're going to be able to look each other in the eye and say, hey, we're saving this planet for many, many future generations. We don't all have to be here at the same time. <laughs> we can plan for a, a sustainable and attainable. Sustainable and attainable. Uh, that's my slogan. Just popped into my head. Nice. I am so glad I'm doing these podcasts with you guys because it brings out, you know, words to try to find the synonyms, you know, for things, try to change the vocabulary. It's not about climate change per se. It's about whether we're going to survive or not, whether the species are going to survive or are they going to go under one by one by one. We'll watch the rhinoceroses go and then we'll watch the giraffes go and then we'll watch the minky whales go down and then we'll watch, you know, and then we'll watch ourselves go down. Are we going to sit here and watch ourselves disappear? I can't believe that. So we have to look at the whole spectrum each time we podcast. We're, we're starting out with a, with a point and branching out and thinking holistically. You know, I call myself a generalist or a holistic thinker or trying to think about the whole pattern. 
and then see my part in it, try to find my small role in it. And I think more and more people are going to be thinking this way. How do I participate? How do I make my child, um, I shouldn't say make, how do I encourage or facilitate or make it possible for uh, my children, uh, neighborhood children, and maybe my nephews and nieces, um, how do I make it possible for them to participate fully, to be expressive, to know that their voice will be heard? That's singing. That's drumming. That's dancing. The dance of life. Why is that a metaphor in a, a sort of a dream that we have? We'll dance our way through life with grace and with um, awareness. Why aren't we doing that? You know, why aren't we doing that? And wh what's the, the worst thing that's happening on the planet uh, in relationship to the best things that could be happening? I so appreciate, Zach, you're bringing up the, the statistics, the, the terrible statistics, that they're fully expecting that 4,000 people are <laughs> going to die on uh, making the, a sports show in the Middle East, in the midst of the desert, and that they're not taking extraordinary measures to make sure that everybody's hydrated, that they've got health insurance. You know what I mean? All these that's, basic, and basic that's with things. that's like an extremely powerful international organization with a lot of money behind it, FIFA, uh, running the show in theory. So then, so then let's think about all the, the Malian migrants, the Nigerian migrants, the Senegalese migrants yep. who have made their way up to like Libya trying to get to Europe and who have found themselves in slavery situations. Yeah. There's a, there's thousands of them, thousands and thousands. And there are slave markets in Libya. And when, I don't think they were there when Gaddafi was there. You know what I mean? A foul dictatorship may be better than what we produced with our uh, intervention in Libya and let's have regime change there. If you don't have a plan for how a dictatorship is going to phase into true democracy, you shouldn't, shouldn't, even if you do, you shouldn't be intervening in that way. You should be negotiating that kind of an evolution, making it possible for a Gaddafi, who I think in one part of his mind was trying to serve the people or trying to make them, he doesn't want them in rebellion. There's got to be a way for dictators like Gaddafi and Saddam, you know, that the guy in Syria, I'm not quite sure how to pronounce his name anymore, is the, all those guys are wanting to preserve themselves. And if we were reasoning with them, really strong reasoning, they would see a way to phase themselves out without having, a, you know, continuous warfare, seven years of war, eight years, nine years in Syria now. I mean, when you think of Afghanistan, Iraq, and then Syria, all the suffering and the agonies and then the refugees basically changing the politics of Europe from democratic to fascistic, one, one country after another being pushed by the fear of refugees and a flood of people coming out of those wars, that's really created the fascisms in uh, Hungary and uh, Poland is moving in that direction. You know, it's like unnecessary. Greece, Greece has the golden dawn hovering over one corner. and France. Yep. All the countries have rising right wings. It's not just the USA and, and a Trump Trumpism that people were mystified by for four years and are still mystified by. We don't understand why we've got 70 million people who think uh, Trump is a respectable president. He may not be a good person, but somehow the hand of God is involved in getting us out of Afghanistan. I mean, Trump, as he's going out the door, is still trying to get us out of Afghanistan and keep a promise. So how do you how do you feel about that? He redu he said he would reduce troop presence to twenty five hundred. I am all for Trump getting us out of Afghanistan. Me too. Because I don't think Biden is going to um, know how to do it. Here's something about Biden that I wish you and Zach would think about between now and the next time we get together. Maybe do a little research on it. 
At one time, when he was head of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate, he had an assistant who I got on the phone because I was anxious to get ideas about federation and confederalism, and that was the person they sent me to, somebody who had these same ideas that Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, wherever you've got a problem of having started a war that you don't know how to finish or how to do an invasion and now you don't know how to transform it into a democratic uh, set of institutions, which is the alleged purpose of these invasions, is to root out terrorism and help Afghanistan to, into a democratic, wonderful future where women have equal, all, equal, equal opportunities, at least with men. All this kind of stuff that is the propaganda that goes with the invasion to get the oil pipeline or the oil out for us, thats it's all obsolete. It is just obsolete. War doesn't work. We don't need more pipelines. We don't need more oil. We need more sunshine hitting panels. You know what I mean? In Afghanistan, they've got a sunshine too, you know. And in Iraq, there's plenty of sunshine. All these desert countries have no need for oil if they get modernized with uh, sun panels and wind energy, et cetera. All of this is possible, so graspable. It's in front of us, and we're not gr grasping it. Instead, we're going with the same old patterns of exploitation. And I, it's endlessly frustrating to me. That's why I'm turning to Born to Groove and want to focus on that, because it's something we can do right here in Millerton. It's something we can do in Lakeville and Salisbury. It's something you can do in your neighborhood in Spain. We I wanted to add, I wanted to just uh, add one little factoid about uh, something we talked about about a minute ago, which was the Trump uh, troop withdrawals in Afghanistan and Iraq. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of, there was a lot of spilled ink about that, at least for 24 hours. Uh, how, I, I want to put this to John. How many how many troops do you think we have in Iraq, and how how many troops do you think Trump pulled out of Iraq just now? I don't know about just now. I thought I saw a headline that he removed twenty five hundred, but I think it was actually that he's going to reduce the total presence to twenty five hundred. Which that is that is correct. Iraq is uh, has been dropped from three thousand troops to twenty five hundred troops. You're saying there were only three thousand in Iraq. Yes, and okay. there were 4,500 in Afghanistan, and now there are 2,500. How many private defense contractors are there? That's a different question. Well, that's surprising <laughs> to me. I, I'm no expert, and I would have assumed there were tens of thousands of troops in both of those countries. Um, that's not a huge number. That's like two Lakeville, Connecticut's of you know troops. So I guess he only reduced by 500 in Iraq. You, you reduce from five, by five, 500 troops out of a number of 3,000. You're reducing one-sixth. That's a 16% reduction in troops. Is that something to write home about? I don't know. <laughs> right. It's the right direction. The, the issue is. here is that they don't have anything to replace this minimal occupation with. The minimal occupation is keeping the Taliban at bay or, you know, less active than they would be. The same thing of in, in Iraq, it's sort of maintaining the status quo, which is terribly fragile. The minute those troops are out, there's a power vacuum because there's not peace inherent in Iraq or in Afghanistan. And that's why I started to, I, I, went, I went around too quickly back to my born to groove focus. The, the thing that could happen in Afghanistan, Iraq, and in Syria, and as a solution to Israel, Palestine, and a, and a crisis, a basket case of Lebanon, everything depends upon engineering, in my opinion, some kind of confederation or federation. They technically have different meanings, but there's got to be something done that would allow every province in Syria, every province in Iraq, every province, and I don't know how many there are, 20, 30, in uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria. They're, this is like counties in Connecticut. It's the next level down of administration. And that's where the Taliban has control of certain parts of Iraq, 
not not Iraq, of Afghanistan, and different sects of Islam, Sunni, Shia, have different predominance in different provinces in Iraq. You've got three, I think, provinces that are Kurdish, and they don't agree with each other. You know, different kinds of Kurdish nationalism are being practiced in different parts of Iraq. If you withdrew the opposition, you know, if you withdrew, with, could solve the problem of uh, an independent Kurdistan impulse and say, look, guys, you're autonomous in your respective provinces. We hope you'll send a representative to the center of this confederation, but you are basically responsible for your own turf that's outlined in these provincial borders, just like we have borders that divide up the, the Kurdish people into four different states, Iraq, Iran, Syria has, has its Kurds that we almost deserted entirely, but not quite. We need the autonomy of those provinces to be like Switzerland, where they really have their own autonomy and send representatives to the center and the reason that the U.S. could could do what Lyndon Johnson wanted to do with Vietnam, can we send you $3 billion, was Lyndon Johnson's plea to the Vietnamese insurgents, the communists who were winning? He said, can we pay you to not have a war and to peacefully develop, help you develop your country? And they said, after all we've been through, uh-uh, you're going to get defeated. <laughs> but... There was this moment, and that's the moment now in, in both Iraq and Afghanistan, when someone, and Biden had these ideas once upon a time, could say, let's have a confederation, and we're going to acknowledge that the Taliban controls these seven or eight provinces. The uh, current status quo in Kabul, in the capital, and uh, some adjoining provinces will be part, you know, have their own elections and send people to the center. Could you send your representatives to an uh, assembly of the Afghanistan Confederation? It means drawing up a new constitution. It means rearranging things to reflect the realities that the U.S. does not control any part of certain parts of Afghanistan or Iraq, that the Kurds want more autonomy. And Ocalan, who's been sitting in prison in Istanbul for 10 years, is a kind of um, theorist of confederation and says we don't need to be outside of Turkey. We could, Kurds could be very happy in Turkey and very happy in Afghanistan or, I mean, in Iraq and in Syria if we just had a measure of autonomy and could deal with each other across these borders and know that we have a certain kind of Kurdish unity, a Kurdish confederation within these four states so that we know that we're responsible for our own destiny. And we would be happy to let the water flow out of Kurdistan's Kurd, Kurdish mountains into as far as Israel. I mean, a lot of water is flowing off those high plateaus of Kurdistan. And right now, I don't know how that is arranged, but they, they're not poisoning the waters. They're not damming them up and calling them for electric power for Kurdistan and screw everybody else. I mean, arrangements can be made to give Kurds a high degree of autonomy in their provinces, respecting the fact that there are different ways to be Kurdish in them, their hills. You see what I mean? A, a spirit of decentralization, confederation, preserves all the borders, preserves the uh, status quo in some important ways, and gradually you try to bribe those Taliban provinces in Afghanistan. Look. We're going to try to figure out a way for you guys to have better agriculture and less dope coming out of Afghanistan. We're going to help you figure out how to educate your girls separate from your boys, if that's what you want. You know what I mean? We can, um, we can make deals, as, as Lyndon Johnson wanted to do in Vietnam when he got desperate. We can make deals with people using some of that offshore money. Trillions of dollars sitting there, not invested. That could be invested in creating working confederations, a tri-state solution in the Middle East. Lebanon in terrible shape, Israel and um, a pac um, Palestine. That's a three. That's a triangle of problems to solve. 
that can be solved in a confederation with its own currency to hold things together, with real estate deals made so that Jews who are on the West Bank can sell to Palestinians at a pretty good price and resettle themselves back in, in Israel. Or vice versa, you know, Israel could be have, having settlements in what is now Lebanon as part of a deal. You know what I mean? Everything's possible if we get out of this war mentality and states that have to be, you know, top-down run to decentralized, democratized, and okay, you guys can evolve a little more slowly toward the larger good of this confederation. And you, if you don't want to send a representative to the center, well, you don't get any money from the center. All, this, all these bucks that are going to flow in from European countries and the USA and everybody who would like to be trading with you guys on this and that, where it's not going to go to your province until you have some elections to show us and are willing to be inspected for not having any cells of terrorists or whatever. You know, bargaining. Bargaining within Confederate things can solve a lot of problems and set up a lot of planetary daycare centers. Play care planet shops opening up in all these places. What's good for Millerton, what's good for Salisbury, what's good for Lakeville, there's towns like these all over the world, and they all need their, you know, a, a degree of autonomy and a, and a caring adult population that says our children are the future, and they're the future of an ecologically balanced planet. Can we get on with that? We can put a lot of people to work with that offshore tax money to planting trees in every corner of Afghanistan, Iraq, Lakeville, Salisbury, Millerton. This needs reforestation is a dramatic, what? What do you want to call it? We need to call it something. We need to keep inventing words that will inspire people to go for this. And uh, reforestation doesn't, not so magical. I'm not coming up with a word. Didn't but, you have a, you're saying conserving consensus? Conserving consensus? I've tried so many peace and poetry with poetry spelled with T-R-E-E -E for reforestation. Reforestation is such an obvious global project, a competition. Who can plant the most trees? And there was a woman in East Africa who got the Nobel Peace Prize, I think, for planting a hell of a lot of trees. That was the right, you know, model. How did she do it? How did she organize the other women to get those trees planted? Because they're the ones who have to go for the water. They're the ones who have to bring in the firewood if they're going to have a cooked meal. The women of the world, were they literate? Were they organized for their own self-interest? could make these dramatic transformations in both child care and uh, empowering children to be performative, which is my big goal, and in getting them well fed. For them to dance, sing, and drum, they need to have some good nutrition each day and clean This water. makes me think of um, the, the New York Times uh, op-ed writer Nicholas Kristof. Oh, he's so good. Who wrote a book with his wife called Half the Sky. It's from a proverb about women yep. holding up half the sky. And basically the thesis is if you just like give resources to women, they'll make the future happen. Right. Yep. If you give it to men, they'll like they'll they'll spend it on gambling and alcohol. Mm -hmm. If you give it to women, they'll invest it in children. The UN could do this, but it, it, it hasn't, and it's been in existence for, for decades. What was that? Doing back. <laughs> it's okay, Angie, you can leave it. Yeah. The, 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 um, the women of the world are the future in, in an important way because they have the, the values of nurturance and caring and sharing and all the things that evolved us as humans, they have somehow been only primarily responsible, not only, but primarily responsible for those sustenance skills and keeping the family together and so on. 
And now they're emerging all over the world in leadership positions, not just Iceland and New Zealand, but the small democracies are thriving with women taking an ever greater part in governance. And Poland has more women in parliament than than men, I think. I heard that somewhere, or 40 percent. No, but it's the potential is there. All I'm saying is that in those very states that ha that are drifting rapidly into fascism, they could just as well be moving steadily into feminism of a of a global kind that is I call it mom wife feminism, M O M, for more of Mother Nature, and wife women in forums emergent, W I F E, but it's it's the it's the kind of feminism that is directed at those roles of mother and wife. And those have been defined by patriarchy up until now, uh, in the last few thousand years. And now we can re redefine that. Mom is more of mother nature, more wilderness, more boondocks, more wilderness corridors, more reforestation in every country of the world. Those, those islands that are threatened with being uh, inundated, they've got to be thinking about how do we have mangroves that where the mix of salt and, what, and fresh water can keep those trees alive. I mean, I'm, I'm just grasping at ecological straws, so to speak. But if we really put our minds to that, of peace, eco-equilibrio, decentralization, confederations solving problems rather than states per se, we've got all the ways of doing it. Switzerland is an amazing model for, for every part of the world. Cantons that have their autonomy. You don't like it in this canton, we'll make you a small canton just for your language or dialect of French or your Romanesh. There's the fourth, the fourth group in Switzerland are the Romani-speaking people, speaking a kind of Romanian or Romani or I don't know how close it is to, the, to Romanian, but it's, it's some kind of a dialect that's just a 600,000 people or 60,000, I don't know. But they get their own little canton if they want it. Everybody gets what they need to feel comfortable in their little corner, in their zone. And most of those cantons turn out to be multicultural. And people deal with the fact that it's German is the dominant language and, or French or Italian or this little dialect of Romanian. It's a model so for the world. I, uh, I did some quick research on the, the Romance language. They think there are probably about 40,000 native speakers. And it is a Romance language descended from vulgar Latin, like yep. the others. Yep. So there you have it. Yeah. Not so far from French or Occitan. Mm -hmm. What's that? The, lang uh, the language of Catalonia? Um, I think Occitan is would be it's on that spectrum close to cat close to Catalan or yeah. Catalonian whatever we call it in English um, would typically be spoken on the Mediterranean coast of France. Yeah. So maybe like in Montpellier or or a, a, a Toulon or a city like that on the French coast. Right. It's interesting that the coasts of France and Italy and, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe, Spain. maybe in the Netherlands and Belgium too, that there, there are these dialects or languages that have their autonomy. And Michael Zwerin, who was a, a jazz trombone player who also wrote for the Herald Tribune in Paris, he wrote a book on Balkanization as a wonderful thing, on how the and this is now 40 years old, maybe. I'm trying to remember the title of the book. Uh, Mike Zwerin, Z-W-E-R-I-N. He wrote a great book, and he went around and visited the people in Escudo, in um, the pe Basque speakers who have some people in France and more in Spain where they've been a big problem, promoted terrorism for a while. But the, the Basques, the Catalans, the, the Bretons in France, 
Um, and then, you know, Welch and Scotch and uh, the different um, languages, Celtic languages in England, now, all these residues of previous traditions, earlier traditions where Celts were all over Europe, and then they wind up being just the Irish and the Scotch and so on. Um, it, it, tracing back to roots is a way to figure out how we can all live together peacefully if we just get the right kind of confederations rather than the these nationalisms, states with uh, with craziness, irrational death trips. They'd rather Charlie, be... I think what you were just what you were just talking about breaking sort of breaking down um, different currents through through Europe, and then coming back to your idea of you know either confeder confederalism or federalism, uh, which is how some might define Switzerland. Um, we could take a country like France where they've had hyper-centralization yep. and, and in Brittany, uh, their cultural identity is, is great. It's still very present, but it's greatly reduced. And France has effectively become a monolingual nation, mm -hmm. even in Corsica, you know, the young generation doesn't speak Corsican anymore. Their grandparents do, but yep. everyone speaks French now, but ultimately Corsica aside, France is not suffering from the same kind of regional strife that a country like Spain does, where regions have a, a greater degree of autonomy, but they've wrestled greatly with, as you mentioned, um, Basque separatist and Catalonian separatist movements. Right. So in that sense, the decentralization has been a great challenge to the, to the, to the Spanish project. Yep. Whereas France has not had to deal with that, so that the, just to play devil's advocate there. Well, the 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 self determination of peoples, which used to be a kind of sacred principle and has almost disappeared from discourse, you hardly any hear. I I don't hear anybody else pushing self determination of peoples and persons, and that's a big big slogan for me. I think that's the only solution to having play care centers evolving new kinds of music and dance and drumming and singing and different forms of poetry and, you know, whole cultural revitalization is only possible and diversification, more cultures, more ways of being. The only way we're going to get that is through decentralization and Spain having to give up Spanish nationalism and pride. No, our pride is in the fact that the Catalans are happy to be part of the Spanish Federation. The Bretons, the, you know, all these folks who are hidden away in valleys, sometimes it's down to 50 people speaking some language that used to be Provence, Provençal or something. You know, all of these things, I think, are aching for revival. We didn't get to be so linguistically diversified, culturally diversified by 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 state state control states are the recent invention that has to be you know diffused america as in trump's make america great again i think all that meant was we got to throw our power around more we've lost too many wars we've uh, you know it's that out of that crazy part of the expression s-h-i-t <laughs> that crazy stuff you know we don't need that anymore it's it does not serving anybody's interests to be hyper nationalist or to have a nation state a state of our own that idea when it's so big the USA or Russia or China these are the dangerous countries with nuclear weapons if we're ever going to get nuclear weapons out of the way we have to decentralize and have mutual inspection mutual respect What's to hide? Why are we hiding nuclear weapons? Why is North Korea so paranoid? I mean, they're really nuts. And at the same time, they're rational. If we don't have our nuclear weapons, we can be run over by any time by somebody who does. China could just come in and occupy us. We'd be keeping our autonomy just because we have nu nuclear weapons. 
I think the deal with North Korea has to be, look, we're going to denuclearize globally, and you won't have to worry about us nuking our way into your region. We can peacefully co-evolve. We don't get peace, we're not going to get ecological balance. We don't get ecological balance, we're not going to have peace. I mean, these, these things are mutually interdependent, not exclusive. We got to solve the, all these problems at once, which is, I am so glad I get to babble here at this um, podcasting. I love it. I love it. And happy to circle around to where wherever you guys think the future might be. And as I go around the circle over and over again, we got to do it locally and we have to do this and this and this and this and preaching the gospel of decentralization. You've got to be the devil's advocate or the you know, well, how come France is so different from Spain on this question? I think I, my hope, and the reason I men mentioned the Michael Zwerin book. On, oh, um, which, uh, can you describe that book? Because I have, I have his Wikipedia page in front of me, and he's, he has quite a, quite a few publications. What was the book you were... It's a little blue book, and it was published here in the U.S. by an organization in San Francisco or out in California somewhere, either planet... What was the topic? What? What was the general topic? Balkanization or um, decent, okay. decentralization. You've got okay. Mike Zwerin's list of books there? Yeah, it's it's in a paragraph, but let's see. What, we have... Because um, I would love to you, plug it every time we get together. Get your Michael you Zwerin wrote, book. It's It's a tiny little book. He wrote a book called uh, Close Enough for Jazz. No way. That's awesome. He <laughs> no, wrote, he's a jazz he trombone a, player. Huh? He wrote another one called the Parisian, the Parisian Jazz Chronicles, an improvisational memoir. He wrote another one called La Tristesse de Saint Louis, de Saint Louis which is the sadness of St. Louis, Swing Under the Nazis. Yep. Wow. Um, <laughs> a force of uh, resistance. Amazing. The Silent Sound of Needles about his struggle with drug addiction. Uh, I didn't uh, know about that. I don't think maybe your book, I don't think your book's in in, on, in this here. It so was, it's probably out of print. You know, people are not mm -hmm. wild about self-determination of peoples. And for most people, balkanization is a dirty word. You know, oh my God, that means that states will be decentralized. And, you know, we'll have, pretty soon Montenegro will want its own government. Why not? We got 200 governments. Why not have 2,000? Why not have a government for every people? And in federations to preserve the borders so that there's no big fights over borders. You know, the, the borders have been changed four or five times of what Poland is. What, what are these battles for? We can't negotiate. We can't have you know, democracy really only works at a small, decentralized scale. That's where you don't have a majority oppressing a minority is when everybody speaks the same language and they can really feel at home with their divisions over how we're going to treat this issue or that issue. We're all one language. We're one people. That one language, one people, one territory, that has to get regularized and we have to have special you know, protections for minorities within every Swiss canton, within uh, Litchfield County. <laughs> you know what I mean? We have to solve these things as neighbors, as people within a, how did Leopold Kor put it? Um, the size of the, the, the optimum size of a community of, of, of equals uh, is what you can see from the highest mountaintop or what you can handle in a small river valley. You know, it, what, what's the geographic parameter for a good living? Turns out to be, you know, where you know somebody who knows somebody about this issue. And you're not an alienated pawn in the game or a, a cog in the wheel. You're a person with a voice. And if you can't get it solved in your hometown... Maybe you can get it solved at the provincial level, at the county level. And if you can't solve it at the county, that's what you need in a, you know, the, the state apparatus 
will hopefully shrink in the U.S. as we denuclearize and de, um, decentralize. We're going to sh shrink the federal government, enlarge the county, and even the state government could shrink. You know what I mean? There's a little bit too much deal making in Albany to suit me. Can we make those deals on Long Island or in Nassau County or, you know, county by county, we can solve problems. You know, you can, you can see Albany from the highest mountaintop in Millerton. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We can get to, and Albany's an hour away. You know, I, gotcha. I, I don't know. We don't, we're going to have to find out what's the optimum county size or the optimum 50 states or how do we, do we want to cluster Northwestern? Is it Oregon, New Brunswick? What, what's, you know, where's Vancouver? You know, it, there's some kind of a unity out there in the Northwest that's not isn't there U.S. Project, isn't there like a loose uh, independent state project like Cascadia? Yeah. Well, there was a, a whole, uh, a couple of books written. I can't remember the name of the author, but he envisioned what, what it would look like if the Cascadia uh, seceded from the USA there's two Californias, obviously, a northern and a southern. Yeah, but this this is kind of envisioned by Thomas Naylor in our second book in the peace series, Thomas Naylor's Paths to Peace. He was not a pacifist, but we, we kind of took his last manifestos and um, statements of the problems that we're having in the USA and put it into one book, volume two in our peace series that Bill Benson edited. I should get in touch with Nader and try to talk about that book on, yeah. his, on his podcast. Do that. But we can talk about these here, too. I'm, I'm looking forward to the point where we go book by book or um, chapter by chapter in Born to Groove and focus in on each one of these things. But it's always good to go around in this circle, like we've been doing in these episodes so far. We need to put catchy names on them. So we can recommend them to friends on Facebook and so on. And and then we get a little bit more systematic as we go along so that we stay on one topic for an hour. <laughs> but it never, I mean, being a generalist, you want to be connecting the most minute particulars, the littlest details. How does a, how does a kid learn how to play a clave beat? How, how many ways into the clave are there? And which is the most fun? way to do this we we can do hundreds of gifts little three second things do it with armpit farts do it with, <laughs> do it with you know what are we what, what will make will be irresistible mm -hmm. to kids and parents or the armpits or sure. annoy parents in a way that kids want to annoy you know their parents my students love is the Ghanaian funeral dancers meme. Have you seen that, Zach? The what? It's a Ghanaian funeral dancers meme. It's like a short video of these guys. They're basically pallbearers. They're holding a coffin at a funeral in Ghana, but they're dancing in step, and like there's this crazy techno music. And my, <laughs> my kids are crazy for it. They're like, can we learn the funeral dance song? Oh, really? I didn't know that. I'll what? send it to you. It's, it's pretty funny. Yeah, but it's been reappropriated as a meme, so that like I don't know, if someone dies in a video game, these guys pop up and they're dancing with the coffin. <laughs> but you're right; it's like which which of these little catchy gifts, yeah, armpit fart claves, or you know, which what's going to catch on and make or it I fun. was thinking of you know three elbow greetings, yeah, and two nose blows, or you know oh what I mean? Oh my god, that's great! We, we should Maybe. invent clave gifts, and then you know, guero gifts. Up, down, down, up, down, down. Okay, what else goes up and down? You know what I mean? We, it, our imaginations, each one of us, is this um, special gift that every one of us gets. You know what I mean? We, we're born and then we have these different, everybody has a different experiential basis for being somebody, as James Brown would say. Are you somebody? <laughs> Yeah, I'm somebody. And what kind of a somebody are you? And I'm hoping that we'll, you know, we'll we'll zero in on those in the 5-minute podcasts 
and relate those to these hour-long ones. And before you know it, we'll be encouraging people all over the world or wherever anybody gets tuned in to making little gifts, gift gifts. What, what does GIF stand for, G-I-F? Oh, gosh. Graphics interface format, maybe? Something like wow. that. Wow. I, I could be wrong. Yeah. Zach, you want to pull that up? Yeah, I'm, I'm on Also, it. I've heard people say it's pronounced GIF, but I'm G- not sure. GIF? I hate that. I refuse to call it a GIF. Me too. <laughs> not going to happen. <laughs> um, guys, we're, we're coming up on an hour here. Great. Cool. Did you Google GIF? It's a graphics interchange format. Hmm. Graphic yeah. interchange format. Yeah. Can't Over whistle. my head. I can't whistle in a mask. <laughs> <laughs> Graphic so, interchange. So yeah, was, I'm glad. I'm glad we're back at it, guys. Yes, we got to do this at least once a week, guys. Yeah, we and I've got to start get, get on a scripting schedule. little, or you know, at least trying out the five-minute format. I can come over there and here do that with you, Johnny. Yep. We'll craft some five-minute ones. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you next Thanks time. Thanks for listening.